Well, yesterday was an historic day. Uh, there was last minute testimony scheduled in the January 6th committee from a former aide to Trump chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Her name is Cassidy Hutchinson. This was scheduled relatively last minute. It was expected to be explosive, and it was. In fact, it was so potentially explosive that I even canceled yesterday's bonus show. Oh, the bonus show where you want to make money. But everybody else that makes money to fund themselves is bad. And if I cancel that, you know, something's big, big is going on. And indeed it was yesterday. We received testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson, former aide to former Trump chief of staff, Mark Meadows, that Donald Trump knew there were people at his January 6th rally with guns and he wanted the metal detectors turned off so more people could get in saying they don't want to hurt me. Trump was so determined to go to the Capitol with the rioters that he allegedly assaulted a Secret Service officer and attempted to commandeer his vehicle. He also threw his lunch at the wall, leaving a ketchup stain dribbling down the walls of the White House and so many other claims. Let's get right into it like nothing we've ever heard before. The impression from Mr. Meadows that the off the record movement to the Capitol was still possible and likely to happen, but that Bobby had more information. So once the president had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby, he thought that they were going up to the Capitol. And when Bobby had relayed to him, we're not, we don't have the assets to do it. It's not secure. We're going back to the West Wing. The president had very strong, a very angry response to that. Um, Tony described him as being irate. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. Sir? The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Well. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Engel. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. Wow. And was Mr. Engel in the room as Mr. Renato told you this story? He was. Did Mr. Engel correct or disagree with any part of the story for Mr. Ornato? Mr. Engel did not correct or disagree with any part of the story. Did Mr. Engel or Mr. Ornato ever after that tell you that what Mr. Ornato had just said was untrue? N neither Mr. Ornato nor Mr. Engel told me ever that it was untrue. Wow. Wow. Assaulting. The allegations here are assaulting a Secret Service agent, attempting to commandeer the vehicle. And I guess I mean, I don't know that Donald Trump knows how to drive. I'm not aware of him ever driving, but I guess attempting to redirect the vehicle towards where he wanted to go and a determination to go to the Capitol. Now, this is arguably the most sort of salacious allegation, but the undertone of all of it is a degree of premeditation and foreknowledge that armed, violent people would be coming to the Capitol on January 6th and a desire for them to be there and a desire for them to wreak havoc and an expectation that they would. No one was surprised in the Trump circle that this is the way it went on January 6th. Incredible allegations. Now, there are now reports that some of the Secret Service officers mentioned dispute and are willing to well get them under oath. OK, what we have right now is Cassidy Hutchinson under oath and we have Trump posting on Truth Social or Troth Central and claims to reporters that Secret Service. Hate. Well, put them under oath right now. This is what we have under oath. OK, second series of allegations that are absolutely outrageous, but not particularly shocking that Trump threw a fit so large that he launched his food at the wall. Of course, his lunch include ketchup, unclear whether they were dinosaur shaped chicken nuggets or what he was eating with the ketchup. That's not a detail we have, but uh, Trump losing it and leaving ketchup dripping down the wall. 
The physical altercation that Ms. Hutchinson described in the presidential vehicle was not the first time that the president had become very. Angry. Oh, sorry. And that's so first we're looking at an, we're looking at one other clip here, uh, but we're going to get to the catch up. Angry about issues relating to the election. On December 1, 2020, Attorney General Barr said in an interview that the Department of Justice had now not found evidence of widespread election fraud sufficient to change the outcome of the election. Ms. Hutchinson, how did the president react to hearing that news? Around the time that I understand the AP article went live, I remember hearing noise coming from down the hallway, so I poked my head out of the office. And uh -oh. I saw the valet walking towards our office. He had said, get the chief down to the dining room. The president wants him. <laughs> so Mark went down to the dining room, and came back to the office a few minutes later. After Mark had returned, I left the office and went down to the dining room, and I noticed that the door was propped open, and the valet was inside the dining room changing the tablecloth off of the dining room table. He motioned for me to come in and then pointed towards the front of the room near the fireplace mantle and the TV, where I first noticed there was ketchup dripping down the wall, and there's a shattered porcelain plate on the floor. The valet had articulated that the president was extremely angry at the attorney general's AP interview and had thrown his lunch against the wall, um, which was causing them to have to clean up. So I, I grabbed a towel and started wiping the catch up off of the wall to help the valet out. Mm. Um, and he said something to the effect of, he's really ticked off about this. I, I would stay clear of him for right now. He, he's really, really ticked off about this right now. Wow. Ketchup, ketchup down the wall. And apparently Trump would regularly throw dishes. And um, uh, that was also testified to. I started wiping the ketchup off of the wall to help the valet out. Um, and he said something to the effect of he's really ticked off about this. I, I would stay clear of him. For right now, he, he's really, really ticked off about this right now. And Ms. Hutchinson, was this the only instance that you are aware of where the president threw dishes? It's not. And are there other instances in the dining room that you recall where he expressed his anger? There were, there were several times throughout my tenure with the chief of staff that I was aware of him either throwing dishes or flipping the tablecloth. Um, to let all the contents of the table go onto the floor. And there you go. Just grabbing the tablecloth and pushing it up and knocking everything over. This was an unhinged man. And most importantly, all I mean, listen, throwing ketchup at the wall from your tendies that your chicken tendies that you're eating. This is not a crime. It does go to Trump's instability on and on and on. But so far, there has been no dispute whatsoever that Donald Trump knew and wanted armed people to be let beyond uh, the um, magnetometers, metal detectors with their firearms. There is no dispute from witnesses that Donald Trump was absolutely determined to get to the Capitol with the mob. And there is absolutely no dispute about all of the claims that everybody, Mark Meadows, Trump, Pat Cipollone, you know, whoever, they all knew exactly that what happened on January 6th was what was expected to happen. No dispute there. Now, one other thing, there are some people making Cassidy Hutchinson out to be some kind of hero. Cassidy Hutchinson is not a hero. OK, Cassidy Hutchinson is cooperating with an investigation. She if she does not cooperate, she is not like Roger Stone or whoever. OK, this is a, a, a mid level staffer. The legal hell that could be rained upon her if she doesn't cooperate or if she lies under oath is extraordinary. She was part of the MAGA crowd. She worked for Mark Meadows and Trump. She agreed with all of it. She at the very end, she didn't like the way that they were trying to steal the election. But she is not a hero. She's acting out of self-preservation. She was there for a year or more. This is the testimony that we needed 12, 14, 15, 16 months ago. Great that she's here to the extent that she's telling the truth. Fantastic. But Cassidy Hutchinson is not a hero. She is here because she's in serious legal jeopardy if she's not here. Period. Let's now move on to the hang Mike Pence uh, circumstances. 
So the other big thing that came from yesterday's testimony by a, a former aide to former failed President Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, is that Donald Trump seemed to be perfectly comfortable with and agreeing with the idea of hang Mike Pence. Hang Mike Pence is a chant that now has notoriously uh, uh, been associated with the January 6th protests. There were right wingers chanting hang Mike Pence. They built a gallows because they were mad that Mike Pence wasn't doing what they believed he should be doing, which is, quote, sending the election back to the states, something he couldn't do. He had no power to do it, but Trumpists believed that he did. And they started chanting, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence. One of the questions that has come up is why didn't Trump do more to ensure the safety of Mike Pence? Why didn't Trump do more to say, hey, guys, this is our great vice president? No, 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 no. None of this hang Mike Pence stuff. And the reason that we now know Trump didn't do anything about it is because he agreed with the sentiments. Hang Mike Pence. We now have another witness who says Trump believed that it was reasonable to hang Mike Pence. Let's go to yesterday's testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson. It wasn't until Mark hung up the phone, handed it back to me. I went back to my desk a couple minutes later. Him and Pat came back possibly Eric Hirschman too. I'm pretty sure Eric Hirschman was there, but I'm, I'm confident it was Pat that was there. Um, I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. Right. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. To which Pat said something, this is effing crazy. We need to be doing something more. Briefly stepped into Mark's office. And when Mark had said something, when Mark had said something to the effect of he doesn't think they're doing anything wrong, knowing what I had heard briefly in the dining room, coupled with Pat discussing the hang Mike Pence chance in the lobby of our office and then Mark's response there to be the rioters in the Capitol that were chanting for the vice president to be hung. Donald Trump didn't do anything about the hang Mike Pence stuff because he agreed with it. And for everybody disputing the testimony, listen, if Mark Meadows, instead of defying the committee, showed up, took an oath, and answered questions, we could clear it up. We could say, hey, you know what? Now it's not just Cassidy Hutchinson under oath. Now we've got Mark Meadows. We could get Trump there under oath and have him answer questions. Did you think it was reasonable for Mike Pence to be hung or hanged? Um, but they don't want to show up. They're refusing to show up. So to the extent that people in the media dispute these claims, show up and answer questions under oath. Let me know your thoughts. Find me on Twitter at Pacman. More on these explosive hearings after this short break. OK, so as yesterday's explosive testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson was taking place on Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, remember, under oath in front of the January 6th committee, Donald Trump had a complete and total childish meltdown on Truth Social, which only further sort of suggests that the allegations about his completely losing his temper and throwing ketchup at the wall are accurate. She was under oath. Trump was on truth social truth central. Yes, exactly. Take a look at this extraordinarily childish meltdown from Donald Trump as, on his platform as the testimony was going on. Quote, I hardly know who this person Cassidy Hutchinson is other than I heard very negative things about her, a total phony and leaker. And when she requested to go with certain others of the team to Florida after my having served a full term in office, I personally turned her request down. Why did she want to go with us if she felt we were so terrible? I understand she was very upset and angry that I didn't want her to go or to be a member of the team. She is bad news. Well, first of all, if she's leaking, she's leaking accurate information. You don't leak. You don't fabricate leaks. It's either a leak or a lie. Secondly, she is under huge legal pressure. It's not that she all of a sudden disagrees with MAGA. In fact, this is why I don't see Cassidy Hutchinson as a hero. She's acting out of self-preservation. She's not like some of these other big names 
She is under serious legal pressure here. And so she showed up and she told the truth as she recalls it. Trump continuing never complained about the crowd. This is the size of the crowd. Cassidy Hutchinson testified Trump wasn't happy with the size of the crowd on January 6th. Trump wrote never complained about the about the crowd. It was massive. I didn't want a request that we make room for people with guns to watch my speech. Who would ever want that? Not me. Besides, there were no guns found or brought into the Capitol building. So where were all of these guns? But sadly, a gun was used on Ashley Babbitt with no price to pay against the person who used it. Trump going on her fake story that I tried to grab the steering wheel of the White House limousine in order to steer it to the Capitol building is sick and fraudulent. Very much like the unselect committee itself wouldn't even have been possible to do such a ridiculous thing. Her story of me throwing throwing food is also false. And why would she have to clean it up? I hardly knew who she was. Well, when you're Trump, lots of people you hardly know are cleaning up after you, sir. Then Trump can Trump losing it over this testimony. She changed lawyers a couple of days ago and with it, her story totally changed. Shocker going on. Cheney conveniently left out the snippet in my speech to go peacefully and patriotically. Isn't she disgraceful? Trump going on. There is no cross examination of this so-called witness. This is a kangaroo court. Well, remember, Republicans opted out of participating other than Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney. Her body language is that of a total bull artist fantasy land. Trump continuing. Will anybody ever be allowed to say the election was rigged and stolen? Will the unselects ever discuss that our country is going to hell because of a fraudulent election? How about analyzing the election results? Trump continuing. I never said Mike Pence deserves it to be hung. Another made up statement by a third rate social climber. Trump continuing a total phony. Trump continuing reacting to a note placed up on the screen that was written by Cassidy Hutchinson. Bad handwriting, that of a wacko. Trump continuing. Why didn't they use the 10,000 troops I offered up on January 3rd? There would have been no January 6th. Actually, there's been no evidence found that Trump had 10,000 troops ready to go. No evidence whatsoever. Trump continuing the woman who was a big Trump fan long after January 6th. If her fake stories were true, why would she want to be was let go and not wanted in Florida? So she made up phony and completely outrageous stories, the crazy of which the craziest of which has already been proven to be a complete lie. That's not true. Nothing's been proven to be a lie. The Secret Service said, according to the media, it wasn't true. Wow. She has now lost all credibility, just like the partisan witch hunt perpetuated by the unselect committee of political hacks. MAGA will put them under oath, sir. Put them under oath. Trump then this morning waking up with more of it, saying the New York Times and Washington Post failed to even mention that today's unselect witness lost all credibility when she got caught in a ridiculous lie. Our country has lost all confidence in the media and our elections. Sad. Um, nothing has been proven false. Donald Trump completely and totally losing it in a meltdown of historic proportions. If anything, Trump melting down this badly for nearly 24 hours suggests the claims made in the committee hearing by Cassidy Hutchinson are at least quite plausibly true and should be investigated. And if there are people who want to swear an oath and come in and say, I have a different view, then they should be invited to do it. But Donald Trump losing it on truth set uh, tr truth, central truth, social while Cassidy Hutchinson is under oath. To me, I know where I'm going to lean in believing. I trust the person who's under oath unless we get some contradictory testimony under oath. So that's Trump's reaction. Let's now go to Fox News's reaction. This is this is absolutely the best. Yesterday, after Cassidy Hutchinson testified that Donald Trump knew and wanted armed people at his rally on January 6th, that Donald Trump assaulted a Secret Service agent, tried to commandeer his vehicle to go to the Capitol, threw food at the wall, leaving a stain of ketchup having to be cleaned up by a number of different people. After all these things happened and the testimony was extraordinary. Fox News was completely in shambles. First of all, 
there's a moment where it's just a silence. They don't nobody knows what to say. Nobody has any idea what to say. It's the most delightful, awkward silence I've ever seen on Fox News. We always point out that there's not a pushback and it would have been great to hear Jim Jordan or some congressman say some other angle to this. But the testimony in and of itself is really, really powerful. Sandra, can you start? <laughs> uh, you take this one, Sandra. I don't know. Uh, just the most ing and the smirk on Brett Bayer's face about like, where do we go from here really says it all. Indeed. Yes, I am here. <laughs> no, Brett, uh, to your point, I just wonder for the for the country watching this in this moment, uh, how much this changes what people believed or did not believe. Right. Aside from it being compelling, I mean, does it even really matter at this point in time? Now, Brett Bayer then making a very good point he, here. He makes a good point, and it's a point I've made on this program as well. Cassidy Hutchinson is there in front of the bright lights under oath while Trump is posting to his social media platform. Truth, essential. Exactly. That, that from hearing it firsthand, she says uh, that both of those men requested pardons from the president. I think what you pointed to, Sandra, was uh, the most uh, compelling when she quotes Mark Meadows saying, uh, Pat, you heard the president. He doesn't care. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong as far as they're literally literally calling for the vice president to be hung. And then Pat Cipollone says this is effing crazy, according to Hutchinson. This testimony was very compelling from beginning to end. She obviously had access to all of the players. True. We are now hearing from the former president on various posts where he questions her uh, Accuracy. He goes after her directly, says he doesn't know who she is and said he didn't lunge at the Secret Service agent in the beast. Uh, that didn't happen. He says he didn't throw his lunch against the wall. That didn't happen <laughs> and that she's lying. Cassie Hutchinson is under oath on Capitol Hill. Um, the president is on Truth Social uh, making his statements. What was so compelling, I think. <laughs> uh, hard to argue. I mean, that, he, that's absolutely true. And Fox News just completely unclear on how to cover this in the immediate aftermath. Now, later in the show, we'll look at what the primetime lineup did with the testimony. They were ready with a smear campaign against Cassidy Hutchinson. They were ready to go. But in the immediate aftermath, in the immediate aftermath, they didn't know how. How do we what do we do here? And Brett Bayer admitting this is some of the most jaw dropping testimony ever to take place in the world of American politics. I've covered politics for a long time. I don't think there's been testimony like this that is kind of jaw dropping in a way on the inside workings of a White House in True. crisis after, you know, at this moment in January 6th that we've seen in since Watergate. Right. And he's absolutely correct. So by the end of this news hour, they were starting to put together their reaction plan. And Martha McCallum shows up towards the end of the show and a sort of just starts to downplay the significance of the testimony. This was the first step in kind of minimizing it. Later in the evening, Fox News went full out smear campaign on Cassidy Hutchinson. We'll get to that. But here's Martha McCallum trying to run a little bit of interference. I would say, John, uh, you know, I'd agree with um, what you all have just been talking about. But I, I would say that we had sort of the basic parameters of what happened with regard ah. to this. We had heard before that the president wanted to go to the Capitol. And, and understand the strategy here is all along when we were hearing these things, they were denying that they were true. Now that the testimony has gotten so specific and explosive from people so close to Trump, now they go, these aren't even really new revelations. Well, you denied the revelations were accurate originally. Pushback against that. So what we're getting today are a lot of details and fill in into yes. just how dramatic that whole situation was. Um, I think that she comes across very credible. She has a good memory for all of these different conversations that were being had and, and clearly the the description of what happened in the beast, which is the president's vehicle, of course, um, of him, you know, wanting to lunge toward the steering wheel, according to this account from Bobby, who was the uh, security secret service person who was in the vehicle, who she says was very shaken up afterwards. The question is, um, you know, all of this is 
obviously riveting. It's it's very dramatic. It was clearly um, a very uh, difficult day for for her and for those who were involved right. uh, and for everybody who witnessed it, I would add. But the question is, in terms of, of the Department of Justice, do, does it move the ball at all on any legal action that they could pursue, or is it sort of an overall uh, filling in the gaps, filling in the story that has an impact on whether or not the former president decides to run again and whether or not any of these details uh, impact people's feelings about that all around. Right. Even if it's all true, even though we downplayed it and denied it all along, and even if Donald Trump was a completely unhinged authoritarian madman, hell bent on keeping a presidency that he didn't actually win and indifferent to the potential hanging of his vice president, even if all of that is true, which we ran interference for for the last year and a half. Does it really matter at this point, guys? Uh, an incredible, incredible way to downplay it. And just remember, they had five hours to get organized before primetime hit later on last night. And after the break, we will look at what became a concerted and calculated smear campaign against Cassidy Hutchinson. That's after the break. If you're just listening today and you want to check out video of these clips that I've been playing for you, make sure that you follow us on Instagram. You can find us on Instagram at David Pakman show. So as we already looked at in the immediate aftermath of the testimony this week from Cassidy Hutchinson before the January 6th committee, like in the hour right after it, Fox News was completely in shambles. Awkward silences. Brett Bayer having no choice but to concede. This is some of the most jaw dropping testimony since Watergate. They didn't know how do we downplay this? How do we manage this? By the time the nighttime came during the so-called opinion programming, they had a strategy and the strategy is smear campaign against Cassidy Hutchinson, Cassidy Hutchinson, who has really nothing to gain from doing this other than than uh, certainly receiving death threats, which I'm sure she started to receive by now and hoping to avoid legal jeopardy, which is why I imagine someone of her position would say, yeah, I'll show up and tell the truth as I recall it. The smear campaign starts immediately. First and foremost, they start accusing Hutchinson of lying, just making it up for personal gain. How would that benefit her? Hmm. OK, let's listen. I serve with both Bobby and Tony. They are career civil service agents. They're former military. They embody what career government officials should be. I would take their word over any word of this junior staffer who is completely, I believe, lying to the January 6th committee for her own self gain. Bobby and Tony. So first of all, Bobby and Tony are not under oath. Cassidy Hutchinson is under oath. If we put them under oath and they have a conflicting account, now we'll have something to evaluate. For the time being, we have Cassidy Hutchinson under oath needing security now, receiving threats now, getting doxxed, et cetera, under oath. And we have Trump posting on Truth Social and we have media reports of two Secret Service agents allegedly claiming that if they testified under oath, they would have something different to say. But they want to say she's just making it all up acted appropriately every single time I travel with the president over 40 separate trips with those two individuals. I would love to hear them contradict this lie with the truth. But I'm you know, I'm a little different on this one. Bobby and Tony need to continue to serve America. We don't need to put them on full blast. If oh, to OK, so don't they're busy doing work. So even though they would say something different under oath, we shouldn't actually bring them in to testify. So uh, the, the weakest possible attempt at smearing her. Then we go to Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram has um, uh, uh, Stephen Miller on and Miller goes, she was such a low level aide, but that doesn't really contradict the subject matter or the substance of what she says. She could be a low level aide or not and still have seen the, the things she says she saw. Reach that way to get. I couldn't remember, but it no, seemed the whole no. no, the whole story seemed ridiculous. But <laughs> no. you knew you knew Cassidy Hutchison. What kind of a you know I, I've met her a few times, but I didn't really have right. much contact. What kind she's of person an, is she? She's an extremely junior low level aide. I don't think I ever had a conversation with her that I can at least recall of, of any of any substance or death. But but to Molly's point, this is a and, and remember the fact that Stephen Miller didn't have deep conversations with Cassidy Hutchinson doesn't mean she's not telling the truth. Test for your sanity. Yeah. If you heard this story and you thought, man, I believe every word of this, I'm going to go online and say something about it energetically. Something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. If right. If you believe she might be telling the truth, you're the crazy person. Instead, you should believe Stephen Miller and Laura Ingram. Ingram, who, by the way, 
was quite literally texting Mark Meadows about the riots, saying one thing and then went on TV that night and said a completely different thing, running interference, saying it could have been the feds, it could have been Antifa, it could have been this certainly wasn't Trumpist or anything like that. She wants us to believe her view about Cassidy Hutchinson when she was implicated in trying to manage the media coverage of those very same riots. And then Ingram continues saying that uh, the entire testimony seemed like an audition for the view. Did you notice she kept saying something something to that effect? She kept couching everything she said. A lot of it was hearsay, obviously not admissible in, in, in any kind of real a court. Um, but she kept saying something to that effect, whether oh. it was about Trump's reaction to Pence and the hanging chant or whatever. But I, I found it all. It was like she was auditioning for a seat of the view or. Now, the fact that she would say something to the effect of to me doesn't really raise any red flags. I mean, it seems natural if you're under oath and you're not quoting something verbatim that you would use that phrase. I, just think about an instance in your mind. If I think back, this is just something so banal, right? L let's think back to when I had a chipped tooth repaired a year and a half ago at my dentist. OK, I remember it vividly. It's not every day that I chip a tooth and it's not every day that I get the tooth repaired. So I, I, I generally remember the, the experience. If you said to me, what exactly did your dentist say about uh, what probably caused it? I wouldn't be able to quote my dentist. So if I were under oath, I would go, listen, my my dentist said something to the effect of my bite and potentially grinding my teeth at night led to the chip. It's accurate. That was the, the that that was the gist of what was said. It's completely representative of my dentist's view. But I don't remember the words that were used. It was a year and a half ago. So I would naturally say something like, well, the, the dentist made me understand that this was the cause. The dentist said something to the effect of the fact that Cassidy Hutchinson is using that term does not to me raise any red flags. Now, she may just not be telling the truth, but right now we don't have any contradictory claims under oath. Put someone under oath and let's get some contradictory claims. Um, OK, then uh, then Hannity. What was the next one here? Oh, no. Uh, Ingram also spoke to other people about Cassidy Hutchinson. Now, the first attempted distraction or shiny object, a former aide to Mark Meadows, Cassidy Hutchinson, was slotted into what was billed as a special, super duper special session of the January 6th committee today. And I spoke with some former White House staffers, three or four of them, in the afternoon, and they knew her well, and not one person had anything good to say about her performance today. Well, why does it matter why extremely biased people with a vested interest in minimizing the insanity of what happened think about her performance? Why does that matter? The question is, did what she say uh, line up with other testimony? The answer is yes. Did what she say get contradicted by anyone else testifying under oath? The answer is no. And is she in any way uh, likely to benefit from this or is she actually exposing herself both to legal jeopardy and to death threats and to needing security and to being doxxed? And the answer is yes, of course it does. Um, Sean Hannity jumping in and participating on this as well. He jumped on the word hearsay. Hearsay has become a big focal point of yesterday's testimony. Today we heard more rumors, a ton of hearsay, and wow, a lot of impeached uh, testimony that we'll get to in a second. And this is why it's never hearsay is never admissible in a real court of law, including this wild claim from a former low-level White House staffer. Watch this. Yeah. So then he goes on to play the testimony. So. The entire hearsay thing. All right. There are so so two things on that. First of all, the fact that Cassidy Hutchinson is recalling what others said does not really change our understanding of it in a congressional hearing. It is true that there are restrictions on what hearsay is admissible in courts of law. We're not even talking about crimes here yet. So why they continue to talk about hearsay? Well, we know why, because other people hear it and they go, it was hearsay. So wait, but does does hearsay mean it was false? Does hearsay mean that she's making it up? No, hearsay relates to courts of law. This is not a court of law. But I want to go beyond that. There are 30 exceptions to hearsay not being admissible in courts of law. 
oftentimes hearsay is admissible in a court of law. There's the present sense impression exception. This is a hearsay statement which could be allowed if it describes or explains something that happened based on something said by someone right after it happened. So when she says, hey, this is what Mark Meadows said right as they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. I'm not saying it would be allowed in a court of law, but there is a present sense impression exception to hearsay restrictions in courts of law, which sometimes can be argued for. There is what's called the excited utterance exception. If you were somewhere and someone made an excited utterance, it was it happened close to whatever it was they were reacting to. It was uh, sort of like a visceral reaction. It was um, uh, it it almost even startled the it just came out of the person making the claim that can be admissible because it was an excited utterance and it may not even be something the person who made the utterance uh, would remember. Imagine that there's you know imagine an explosion happens right in front of you. That's such an unusual thing. I might go. Oh, oh, look at this. I knew I knew this was happening. This was my cousin Joe. I knew he was going to do. I might not even remember that, but a court might say to someone who heard me make that excited utterance, we're going to we're going to allow that even though it's hearsay under the excited utterance exception. The point here is this attack on everything as hearsay as if it's some open and shut thing. Well, it's hearsay. It wouldn't be allowed in a court and therefore it can't even be believed in this setting. It's BS and it's a scripted and coordinated attack. Last thing, Mark Levin on Fox News just completely losing it and demanding that news networks fire their legal analysts for not properly attacking the entire January 6th committee proceedings. You also do not participate in a transition period and order the Department of Defense to work with the Biden people. Easy, buddy. They have no evidence for any of this committee's come up with nothing despite the fact it's all one way. And I want to encourage networks all over the country who I'm sure will listen to me. Fire your legal analysts, fire them. There's too damn many former federal prosecutors. This isn't about a federal prosecution. These legal guys, they keep coming on. They know nothing about the Constitution. A president, a candidate has the right to lobby a lobby. The state legislature if he or she believes that the elector should be for them. It's Just because he's yelling doesn't make it true. Mark Levin should try decaf and he is just furious, furious that not every legal analyst is saying it's all lies and it's all imprison the people doing the investigation. Mark Levin isn't happy. So that's the totality of the smear campaign that Fox and the right wing put together in just a few hours after Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony. OK, last thing on yesterday's testimony in the January 6th committee hearings by Cassidy Hutchinson, and this has nothing to do with Cassidy Hutchinson herself. Liz Cheney yesterday during the committee hearings at the end revealed that in mafia mob boss style, Trump associated individuals have been contacting witnesses and sort of suggesting to them, eh, you should remain loyal. Be careful what you say. Here is Liz Cheney uh, revealing what is quite clearly witness tampering, the intimidation of January 6th committee witnesses. Here's how one witness described phone calls from people interested in that witness's testimony. Quote, what they said to me is as long as I continue to be a team player, they know I'm on the right team. I'm doing the right thing. I'm protecting who I need to protect. You know, I'll continue to stay in good graces in Trump world. And they have reminded me a couple of times that Trump does read transcripts. And just keep that in mind as I proceed through my interviews with the committee. Remember, Trump reads transcripts. That's intimidation. That's witness tampering. Here's another sample in a different context. This is a call received by one of our witnesses. Quote, a person let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal and you're going to do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. Right. 
You're gonna do the right thing, kid. I think most Americans know that attempting to influence witnesses to testify untruthfully presents very serious concerns. Yes. And so this is the latest even within. So the the hearings are looking at what took place and may find that crimes took place in relation to the hearings. It appears as though more criminality is taking pl a place. Our friend Jamie Raskin recently appeared on our program. Congressman Jamie Raskin was asked about this uh, and its potential criminality. And here's what he had to say. Um, the Well, the evidence of witness tampering um, that the committee has released are the two episodes that the vice chair uh, cited today anonymously for obvious reasons. Um, it's a crime to tamper with witnesses. Correct. It's a form of obstructing justice. The committee won't tolerate it, and um, we haven't had the chance to fully uh, investigate it or fully discuss it, but it's something on our Mr. agenda. Mr. Folks, there may be people charged with crimes in relation to the committee, like th think about the multi layered insanity of that. You've got the subject matter being investigated by the committee, which could lead to criminal charges. But you could have subsequently an investigation into Trump world's actions related to the investigative committee, and there may be crimes there. It's crimes all the way down, seemingly unbelievable what is going on. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to get to other stories, including new polling about the 2022 midterms and much more. Stay with me. There's been a dramatic turn of events in 2022 polling over the last couple of months, and I don't want to overstate this, but I also don't want to ignore the story because when three, four months ago I was saying, guys, listen, everyone must vote and we have to do everything, fight for every seat, all of these things. But it's not looking great for Democrats in 2022. I think Democrats will lose the House. I think Democrats will lose the Senate. Some of you wrote to me and said, David, why are you writing it off? You should just say we can win it. I was like, well, I'm not writing it off. I'm just telling you what the polling is and I'm being realistic. The polling has reversed reversed dramatically and Democrats are now ahead of Republicans in three recent polls looking at a generic 2022 ballot. A generic 2022 ballot means regardless of where you are, you plan to vote for the Democrat or for the Republican. This is not normal. OK, and again, now there's the risk of, of, of another unintended consequence of mentioning this, which is if I say, oh, Democrats are doing great now, then people will say, well, I don't need to vote. Um, I don't quite frankly think this show is big enough to have that much of an effect one way or the other, but we all must vote. But we should understand the numbers. Three new polls in a new Marist poll in a congressional ballot. Democrats, 48 Republicans, 41. That's a plus seven for Democrats. That's a big, big deal in a new political morning consult poll. Democrats, 45 Republicans, 42. That's plus three for Democrats. And then in a new Yahoo News, YouGov poll, Democrats, 45 Republicans, 38. That's plus seven for Democrats. Why are these numbers such a big deal? There's two reasons. Number one, this is not typically what you see when one party has taken the White House in the previous election in 2020. Democrats took the White House from Republicans. Biden beat Trump. You all know that. And typically, almost always, with like three exceptions, when that happens, you would expect Republicans to do really well in the first midterms, which would be four and a half months from now in November. So number one, the fact that the numbers differ from that traditional historical reality is a really big deal. But the second reason that it's a really big deal is this is not the way the numbers look just three months ago. And I think that we can all sort of take a cynical approach here and say this is temporary. It'll go back to Republicans crushing Democrats by November. Well, it's not obvious to me, but one of the things we've been talking about now for about two months is are there unique circumstances in this election that make it potentially OK for Democrats when Republicans should be winning? And I say that the answer is yes. This is not a guarantee of anything. I'm still getting lots of people on Twitter saying, David, you loser. Some of them say worse things than that. Republicans are going to crush Democrats in November. Just wait and see. Well, maybe. But there are some different circumstances here. First of all, normally when we say, oh, 
Democrats can win by running on abortion rights. No, that historically that's not a good issue for Democrats to run on. It's not a winning issue. It's not a voting issue for Democrats. It's the type of issue that will motivate Republicans to come out to vote against a pro choice candidate. Typically, that's the way it is. This time around, it looks like it could be different. Americans are more in favor of abortion being legal in most cases than at any time over the last 50 years. So public opinion is different now than it has been on abortion. And in addition to that, Republican uh, appointed Republican nominate Trump uh, nominated Supreme Court justices have overturned Roe v. Wade, something which two thirds of Americans are in disagreement with. That is different. And that means in this election, that situation could make it better for Democrats, particularly if they say we're the ones trying to keep these rights, whether it's credible or not, that that's what Democrats are going to do. Secondly, normally running on gun safety regulation is a losing issue for Democrats. We've talked about it before. We've talked about it with a number of political strategists. When Democrats make gun safety regulations a big part of their campaign, it doesn't really motivate Democrats to come out and vote for them but it does motivate Republicans to come out and vote against them. However, the rash of school and other mass shootings in the United States over the last three months and just tragic numbers, hundreds of mass shootings in the United States in 2022 so far uh, seem to have tired out and exhausted many Americans about the Republican Party's unwillingness to consider serious gun safety regulations. And so you have a situation where in this particular midterm, it might actually work for Democrats to run on gun safety and on abortion rights. So that's different than normal. The other element that is different than normal in these midterms is that we are coming up against the tail end of the six year Trumpian cycle. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Normally, you have a sort of relatively similar electorate throughout three elections. So like if you look at, I don't know, 2000, 2002 and 2004 as an example, the electorate, George W. Bush won the presidency in 2000 and then you had the 2002 midterms and Bush won reelection in 2004. There was no major change to the electorate in the year 2000, which then had to sort of sort itself out in 2002 and in 2004. It was a very similar electorate. OK, that is not the case right now. In 2016, you had all of these formerly non political, non voting people who were enamored with Trump, a lot of low information voters, a lot of uh, uh, extremists of different kinds, people who were clueless. These people were not participating in politics before 2016. They appeared in 2016. Um, And then in 2018, um, some of them voted in the midterms. And then in 2020, they were still around and trying to get Trump reelected. And now Trump's gone. And there's a real question as to do these Trumpists vote in midterms where now Trump isn't even a candidate and Trump is less visible and so many other things are going on? Or do those people that only entered the political space thanks to Trump's uh, presence, do they just kind of go back to whatever they were doing before? I don't know what that is, but it didn't include voting. We don't know the answer to that, but it's potentially something that will really change Uh, the makeup of the 2022 midterm electorate. So do I have a definitive answer? I don't. But when we see Republicans were winning every generic ballot three months ago, Democrats are now winning every generic ballot. That is a major change and potentially significant. So I'm not ready to count out Democrats in 2022, but we must vote. We must get involved in campaigns phone banking, all of it. And we'll be doing everything we can to cover these uh, to cover the the important races and the midterms at large. I want to mention this, but not spend a ton of time on it. Again, people are talking about Hillary 2024. I've actually seen some op eds saying Hillary is exactly what the Democratic Party needs in 2024. This is very hard for me to uh, believe is a good idea for Democrats in 2024. Uh, One such article talking about this is by CNN's editor at large, Chris Saliza. It's an article called The Whispers of Hillary Clinton 2024 have started. And uh, Saliza writes in the immediate aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, 
conservative writer John Ellis went to the Internet to make a provocative case. It's time for Hillary Clinton to make another political comeback. He wrote, quote, now is her moment. The Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade creates the opening for Hillary Clinton to get out of stealth mode and start down the path towards declaring her candidacy for the 2024 Democratic nomination. Ellis's argument is one. Joe Biden will be 82 and is just going to be too old to run again. And number two, the Democratic bench is not terribly strong. He's not the only person eyeing a Clinton reemergence. Going on to write that Juan Williams, the Democratic pundit, recently made the case that Clinton should become a major figure on the campaign trail this year to reset herself as a potential candidate for 2024. Um, I have two thoughts on this because I, I've been talking about there needs to we need someone else. We need there needs to be someone else here and continuing to recycle the same candidates doesn't seem like a great idea. Hillary Clinton is no spring chicken herself. OK, in 2024, she'll be 76 at the time of the 2024 election. So the idea that Biden's too old at 82. So what Democrats need is 76 year old Hillary Clinton. I don't know that that's like a super strong argument to me, but there's this intangible feeling that even if you can at some kind of micro level make this case that the Democratic Party is just ready for something different. Now, I've said some of the people I'm interested in are Jamie Raskin. I, I know anti-Semitism could be maybe a, a, a problem for him, but I think Jamie Raskin would be a fascinating candidate. I would love to vote for Jamie Raskin. I think John Ossoff. The senator from Georgia, super interesting, although maybe he's not yet experienced enough, maybe too young. Um, I, I've listed other people who, who I think are interesting. None of them have the name recognition of Hillary Clinton, and I concede that right away. But it seems like exactly the type of mistake that Democrats love to make to say, now let's go with Hillary once again. I just am not seeing it, and it sounds like a disastrous idea, but I want to hear from you. Let me know what you think about this idea of Hillary 2024. We have a voicemail number. That number is 2192 David P. Uh, I've talked about people canceling memberships. Here's someone who's so furious about our recent guest hosts that he's signing up for memberships merely to cancel them. Listen to this. Hello, this is Alan from New Jersey. I'm calling to speak to Pat. Because Pat just claimed that Luke Beasley did a good job substitute hosting the show. Yeah. Luke Beasley did not do a good job. He did a terrible job. And I need to cancel my membership and then cancel it a second time. That's how disappointed I am at Luke Beasley is I can't cancel once. I have to cancel my membership, then sign up again, and then cancel a second time right. to show how disappointed I am at Luke Beasley. He's horrible. He, it's Pat or Baron Cousins or no one. Wow. Those are the only two options, Pat, Baron Cousins or no one. Wow. Very, very strong. Now, obviously, he's kidding about signing up just to cancel memberships. Extremely strong feelings about our guest hosts. Every guest host got rave reviews and terrible reviews. So we're we're not picking on Luke Beasley here at all. Uh, there were people who wrote to me and said Luke was fantastic, but I can't stand Farron's facial hair and I didn't like Pat's delivery. There were people who wrote in and said, Pat's great. He knows the flow of the show. Everybody else is bad. There were others who wrote in and said the only guy ready for prime time is Farron. Pat and Luke don't know what they're doing. Listen, hopefully there was a little bit of something for everybody. That's the hope. We have a fantastic bonus show for you today. Stacks of bodies found dead in a trailer. A horrifying story. We will we will talk about it. Elizabeth Warren says Democrats are two votes away from codifying Roe v. Wade. But is it too late? And a study finds that cannabis users are 25 percent more likely to need emergency care or hospitalization. But is it because of the cannabis? I know I mentioned these were yesterday's stories. Yesterday's bonus show was canceled. Oh, the bonus show where you want to make money. But everybody else that makes money to fund themselves is bad. Yeah, because of yesterday's emergency House uh, committee hearing. The bonus show was canceled, so we will do those stories today. Sign up for the bonus show at joinedpacman.com. You can use the coupon code INDICT. 
That's I N D I C T. Indict. You all know what it means. Everybody knows what that means right now. Sign up at joinpacman.com. I'll see you on the bonus show or otherwise back here tomorrow.